welcome to the firm. On the show this week. SEBI's criteria for rejection of draft offer documents. Clarity, confusion or counterproductive? And is the tide turning for transfer pricing cases in India? Does your capital structure involve circular transactions to build up net worth? Have the auditors qualified your audit report? Have you willfully concealed any litigation? Well, if you are an issuer looking to raise public funds and if your response to these questions is in the positive, then chances are SEBI will reject your draft offer document. So says a new SEBI circular. And why not? After all, it is SEBI's mandate to protect investor interests and ensure quality disclosures. All good then? Well, not quite. Because that circular also says your draft of a document can be rejected if the object of the issue is vague, if the gap between raising funds and utilization is unreasonably long, or if your business model is exaggerated, complex, or misleading. Vague, unreasonably long, exaggerated words that could be interpreted widely. Hence, the circular has drawn severe flack. Paiswini Upadhyay finds out if this attempt to codify SEBI's scrutiny process will give issuers clarity and investors protection or will it prove to be counterproductive. Over 8,000 listed companies on BSC and NSC combined. Compare this to the United States where the listed universe comprises of slightly over 5,000 companies. Hong Kong is around 1,400 and Singapore 800. Back home, SEBI was concerned about the quality of companies coming to the market. And so, its primary market advisory committee suggested the market regulator consider some objective criteria to clear draft offer documents. Last week, the regulator released a set of 16 broadly worded criteria that could lead to rejection of draft offer documents. Put things in perspective really for this order. Uh, for last quite some time, if you see, SEBI has been criticized by by media and by by sort of uh, by issuers in the past that SEBI has not been very prompt in clearing the documents once they are filed with SEBI because the expectation under the ICDR regulations is SEBI must clear a document within 30 days of filing it. In most situations, you would have thought the SEBI has not been able to clear the document is because they haven't been given complete set of information as and when SEBI asked for it or as and when you know SEBI expected them to be in the offer document. So it's pretty much codifying what SEBI has been asking the banks and through banks the companies in the past. For instance, an auto parts maker that went public in May this year was asked to submit details on type of related party transactions and their aggregate value in relation to the turnover of the company in past three years. SEBI has now made this as one of the conditions for rejection of draft of a document saying that if the issuer enhances its prospects based on business with related parties, it could lead to a rejection of offer document. Last year, a school management company that went public was asked to disclose in its draft offer details of loans and status of pending application for licenses. SEBI has now codified this by saying that critical licenses, if not received, can become a ground for rejection. I think at the back of this circular, what investment bankers will do now is spend a lot more time with the company while the company is preparing for an IPO. If there were issuers in the past who were not forthcoming with a lot of the information, it gives the bankers uh, definitely some ammunition in their hands to demand that information and disclose it correctly. Uh, I think a lot more scrutiny or discussions and deliberations about the objects of the issue, where the money will be used. Uh, studying of the financial statements of the company, all of that is going to lead to better investor disclosure for sure. Not just that, some risks were earlier only required to be disclosed. Now, SEBI has added them as potential grounds for rejection. For instance, qualified audit reports and major pending litigation. Let's assume a winding up petition against the issuer. In such a scenario, one of course has to evaluate the merits of the case. So is that winding up petition serious? Who is the person who's who's moved court on that on that in that manner? Uh, is he a supplier who barely supplies, you know, maybe a small component to the company? So one has to go down into the merits of that com of that case. But finally, let's assume that SEBI does believe that this is very critical. What they would probably advise is, look, let's just wait, see what the outcome of the winding up petition is, and then go ahead. 
Because what happens in the other case? Suppose one just goes ahead with the IPO with a mere disclosure and tomorrow indeed the company is told to wind up or the court decides against the company, what happens to the public investors who have come into the company? I think SEBI has been fairly uh, uh, sort of consistent about what kind of disclosures you need to make of those qualifications. We have consistently disclosed them as a risk factor and probably one of the most prominent risk factors depending on of course uh, how material the qualifications are. But in past from what I understand, you know these have not been the reasons why uh, someone was not allowed to do an IPO. So more disclosures and stricter rejection criteria that amount to more effective investor protection. Now no one can complain about that. But it's the language used in some of the rejection conditions that has perturbed a section of the market. For instance, a vague object of the issue, an exaggerated, complex or misleading business model, direct or indirect conflict of interest between issuer and merchant banker can all become grounds for rejection. In law, more adjectives you use, there is room for interpretation. So if there is the word which is vague or exaggeration which has been used, it's possible to interpret it, it's possible to distinguish that. And in case SEBI has rejected an offer document on the basis of the vagueness which has been used in the offer document or exaggeration which has been there in the offer document, there is room for interpretation and an issuer company surely can appeal to the tribunal and can approach securities appellate tribunal distinguishing that there is no vagueness, there is no exaggeration and please set aside the order of SEBI. Besides increased litigation at SAT on the wording, experts say that some specific rejection conditions do not take into account the needs of certain businesses. For example, if there is a uh, ship freight company which is raising money for the purpose of buying ships. Now I can't identify the ships at day one as to these are the vessels which I am going to identify because the ship buying and selling market is so very volatile or is so very fast changing that I by the time uh, the offer document is approved and I go to the market to raise money those particular vessels may not be available for buying or selling in which event I may not completely qualify within the objective criteria. If I was a company which was largely into manufacturing and if I enter into retail now, it is quite possible that so far I was not required to invest so much money in, in, in creating brand build, in creating the brand of, 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 my, of, my, of my retail products. But going forward I will be, I will be required to. So I think this is something SEBI will have to keep in mind while assessing an individual case. And that could be the reason why this order, as Menika mentioned in the beginning, has drawn severe flag. Because bankers and issuers are concerned about the subjectivity this circular brings to the scrutiny of offer documents. On its part, SEBI has said that these 16 conditions are illustrative and the mere triggering of any or a few criteria will not mean an automatic rejection of the offer document. So if SEBI's attempt leads to enhanced due diligence by investment bankers, more disclosures and better prepared companies coming to the market, no one would have reason to complain. But if the broad wording of this order is used to reject offer documents without sound reason, it could make capital raising tricky because a rejection would disallow the issuer from accessing capital markets for at least one year and hence is unlikely to go uncontested. In Mumbai, Paiswani Upadhyay. You know, SEBI's proposed IPO safety net mechanism has also come in for loads of flack. Same reasons, a misguided effort at reducing risk in a risk inherent instrument. So is SEBI overreaching its protection mandate? Well, much has been said about that across newspapers, in editorials and on TV channels. So I'm going to focus on a different issue. Coming up next. Is the tide turning for transfer pricing cases in India?